Are you back? I am back. Woohoo! All right. Uh, I think everything's running. So, okay, welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Learning Space. I am uh, your hostess, Nicole Gallucci. I am a postdoc with the CosmoQuest project. Uh, unfortunately, my co host, Georgia Bracey, has class things to do, so she won't be able to join us tonight. Uh, but I have with me a very fabulous guest who was very fabulously represented in the banner for this um, for this hangout. <laughs> we have Stephen Grenad. There. This side. I don't know what side he's on. <laughs> I'm on one side. Hello. Hi. Welcome. All right. So as usual, you guys can uh, join in with the comments on the event page uh, over on Google+. And I know YouTube's comments are all new somehow, but I'll still be watching the YouTube comments as well. So say hello, ask a question, add a comment, and I've got the Q&A app on. So I will try to watch all of those places for comments and questions and whatnot. Uh, so join in. Watch um, all the things. Yes, watch all the things. That Yeah, I used to be able to watch all the things in Comment Tracker, and then they changed it. So, oh well. <laughs> we'll watch all the things somehow. Uh, so we are going to talk uh, tonight about uh, doing science outreach through science fiction or at strange places like science fiction conventions, which is something that Stephen is very, very awesome at, as I've seen him do uh, at Dragon Con. So maybe you want to start with a brief overview of the kind of stuff you do. I know you do a lot for Dragon Con, <laughs> but also um, any other, uh, or maybe just how you got started with this. Sure. Well, my background <clears throat> is in physics. I'm a, a physicist who fled academia because jobs. <laughs> I know you've never heard Not that before. Not vigorously, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. um, and so I got to my job. I'm in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, working for a company that does essentially contract research for NASA, for the DOD, for various and sundry folks. And I had some friends that were volunteering at the Dragon Con Media Science Fiction Convention. And I say media because, as I learned, there are a couple of different flavors of science fiction conventions. And Dragon Con is one that is focused more on things like TV shows and movies uh, as opposed to the more literary science fiction conventions that are the, the classic ones. So I had some friends that volunteered at Dragon Con over in Atlanta, and they said, hey, we do AV kind of stuff with something called Tech Ops. Why don't you come join us? It's like, well... My memory of science fiction conventions, having never been to one, is more like that <laughs> classic William Shatner bit on yeah. Saturday Night Live where he's getting into fights with the audience and things, and it just looked really unfun. But they managed to talk me into it, and I went and, and felt kind of embarrassed about it for a while. And How many Dragon I, Cons ago was this? That would have been uh, about ten. Okay. <laughs> so I clearly didn't stay embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, I, I think part of it was just sort of a reflexive, oh, I don't want to be seen as one of those nerds, mm -hmm. even though I am one of those nerds. Yay. So I, I was volunteering, I was running sound and, and moving equipment around and things like that. And the people who were the directors of the fan track for space and science, because yes, Dragon Con has a fan track for space and one for science and mm -hmm. one for robotic making and things like that. Uh, they found out I had a, a physics degree and said, hey, do you want to come talk about science? I said, oh, all right, sure. So I did a little talk about what my graduate research had been in, which was cooling and trapping of neutral atoms. Take lasers, take atoms, cool them down to as close to absolute zero as you can get. Everything is better yes. with lasers. <laughs> Everything is better with lasers. And in that case, a bunch of people did that and Nobel Prizes popped out. So it was mm. cool research in all the different ways that it can be cool. And after that, they said, yeah, come back, do some more. And I realized I kind of missed doing that thing that you do in graduate school where it's like, all right, I've got to learn this new thing. Let me dive into it and figure it out. I hadn't been doing that in my job, and so I started doing that to talk about science at sort of a lay level at science fiction conventions, and it turned out to be something I really enjoyed. So it was clearly all a master plan to get to go to science fiction conventions and talk science. <laughs> awesome, awesome. We got, um, okay, we got a question, we have a question, which isn't a little off topic, but it's awesome, so we're going to bring it up anyway from okay. Trevor. Uh, since this is about space, I have to ask, is there really life in space? I just want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Uh, how Steven, far is there out life in, in space? <laughs> how far out in space? We've got life uh, very close in space, if you count low Earth orbit. There you go. Um, Microbes. Yeah. I don't know. I certainly hope so. That's yeah. one of those things that I think is in those we can't really know until we get proof one way or the other. 
Um, but gosh, I really hope so. I really hope so, and I really hope if we find it, it's in my lifetime. That's usually my Yes, <laughs> that. yes, please. Yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting topic. I did teach a semester class on that topic because it is that interesting. You can get a whole semester out of it, cool. uh, even though we don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot to explore. So awesome. So did you cover like um, how we go about looking for life? What are the yeah. things that we? I went through each of the factors in the Drake equation, <laughs> cool. and like here's the here's what we understand of this concept right now. You know, there's right. easy ones like star formation, and then there's difficult ones like the nature of intelligence. So it right, yeah, goes on. So, so yeah, and we got a comment. Get your learning on from James. Hi, James. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so what kind of th so okay? So you started off talking about your research at uh, Dragon Con. Was this when space and science were one track, or right? This after was the split? when there was just one of them, and right, then right. they split, and so then I had to start talking on both of them. Woo! Yes. Thing. Space is so cool to get the soundtrack. It is cool. <laughs> I, I have that sort of physicist disease about, well, I should be able to figure that out, whether or not I actually know anything about it. <laughs> um, but so, I am I am at least willing to, to come out and say, I'm telling you sort of a surface level, and right. if you want to know more, I'll tell you where to go to yeah. find out more. So I'm, I'm trying not to lie, but I am trying to simplify to make things understandable right, right. to people who don't have a background and to people like me who are not deep into whatever the fields are that I'm talking about. So what other kind of topics um, do you talk on at, at conventions? Oh gosh. I, I've always been interested in a wide array of things and so it's whatever sort of thing has struck my fancy. Mm -hmm. I have done quantum computing which was at least related to my research. I have done the Pioneer Anomaly back when we thought that yeah. the, the Pioneer space probes were accelerating more than they should. Um, and that was still in the middle of it when we didn't know exactly why that was happening. I've talked about optical and visual illusions and what they tell us about how our brain processes mm -hmm. information. Uh, I have talked about the physics of the Whedonverse. Uh, that was actually a really fun panel because I, I was on a panel with Jennifer Ouellette, who's a fabulous yes. science writer who had written a book on the physics of the Buffyverse, so she handled the Buffy stuff. Uh, Jason Schneiderman, who is a neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins, who talked about the then current dollhouse. And then mm -hmm. I got to pretend to know planetary ah. stuff and talk terraforming and solar formations and things like that to talk about Firefly, Firefly. Okay, and the way yeah. that that solar system was supposedly put together. Very cool. Very cool. Actually, are you on the back channel for the convergence stuff by any chance? I am. Okay, fact. okay. <laughs> that, that, of course you are. No, I'm gonna, I, can't, <laughs> I can't keep track of. Okay. <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah, Sorry. It's, I'm like, no, no, I've totally talked to you on that email list. Okay. I, I started doing this at Dragon Con, and then yeah. I ended up doing it at Balticon, and oh. then we did some science at uh, Geek Girl Con, and now right. can, I'm looking at getting involved in Convergence and I'm so all the cons. Your, your the cons. influence is spreading. <laughs> your influence is spreading. What, um, do, you, do you costume at the cons? I, do you not until this year. I finally had enough friends who said, you really should do that. And it helped that there was um, an anime I had been watching, if you're familiar with uh, The Last Airbender and then okay. the sequel, Korra. There is this older bald dude who is a mentor to the new Avatar. And I'm like, I can do older bald dude with <laughs> arrows and, and yeah. giant beard and robes and things like that. And I've got a friend who is really good at costuming and props and who agreed to help me. So she nice. airbrushed my head and my hands with the arrows with this paint that only comes off with alcohol, which is good <laughs> because it's really hot at conventions. Yes. And did the beard, so for a while it looks kind of like James Hetfield if you're a Metallica fan. Um, <gasps> this is my same friend, Renee White, who did all of the sock puppets for my recent retelling of Prometheus. With oh, sock we're going to get to that. We're totally going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> if I was, if I could figure out how to do sound on these things, I would show it. But I'll just show the link. Um, I didn't see that costume. I did see your Breaking Bad costume, though. Yes, I did a, a Breaking Bad, Bad because again, bald dudes. I could bald pretend to be, I could pretend to be Walter White, and uh, you were giving out. I, I think I was Jesse, and I gave out meth candy. Yeah, I had some meth candy. It was very tasty. <laughs> Oh man, um, so different cons, um, but you do some other stuff with Dragon Con too. You do some more media stuff as well. Right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The group I had been volunteering with, Technical Operations, Tech Ops, mm -hmm. handled sounds, lights, things like that. And around about 2004, some of the people who were on that staff 
realized as the convention was getting bigger, you had people standing in lines a lot, and you had people waiting in ballrooms and getting bored, and bored geeks are, are a really scary thing because there's no <laughs> telling what they will invent to do. Yes. <laughs> so they thought, well, we've got these giant projectors. Why don't we project some stuff? Mm -hmm. And they had in-hotel channels because the host hotels at DragonCon turn over one of the channels for convention programming. Well, there's a limited amount of convention programming, and then there was a lot of dead air. So we decided to fill that. Um, some of my friends, Brian Richardson and uh, Patrick Freeman, sort of started this fake TV channel and started writing and producing skits. And they needed people who would be willing to get in front of a camera. And my dirty secret is that I have a BA in theater arts. So any sense of shame I have was burnt out a long time ago. <laughs> so they said, hey, you want to do some short skits? I said, meh, sure. Sure. So now I do video stuff for Dragon Con as well. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, I, I love uh, when I'm sitting in those big rooms waiting. Uh, they have the um, that Cartoon Network type thing. The bumpers. Yes, is that what they call it? Yes, because they're they're the things that bump up originally be between programs. They're the, oh, okay. the beginning and end of, of programming. Yeah. And Adult Swim does these. Adult, adult Swim, yeah, yeah. The that adult we swim totally did not steal and recreate <laughs> for our own purposes. And I okay. end up writing a lot of those as well. Awesome. Now, ah, oh, I didn't know that. That's so Yes, cool. <laughs> I am that guy who does oh a lot of God. those. Yay. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so um, talk about different things at cons. Mm -hmm. um, and then, okay, so so things related to cons, uh, since you did helped us with the Do It Yourself Science Zone, which we talked to Ray and Matthew about last week, two weeks ago, something like that. <laughs> we talked about that recently. Um, there was some interesting fundraising efforts that went along. So now not only are you speaking at cons, but doing extra bits of things yes. related. So why don't you tell us about Sock Babies? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I dig the, up the link. <laughs> yes. Um, for those of you who didn't see the program when Ray and Matthew were on, we were fundraising to bring a bunch of us, including Nicole, to Geek Girl Con to put on a hands-on DIY science zone. This was um, Ray's brainchild, and it's a great one, yeah. because there are people at cons who are interested in science and would just like to, to see some of it, and doing hands-on experiments, um, even at a small scale, is a great way to learn this kind of stuff. It, it really brings it home and lets you get involved instead of sort of my traditional mode, which is be on a panel and talk at people, which right. I enjoy, but is not the sum total of it. So we had a, a sort of super team of a bunch of different scientists on all these different disciplines to come and do different experiments. We extracted DNA from strawberries. There was edible astronomy. We did some of the genetic taste tests where it's a chemical that if you've got the right allele of a particular gene, it will mm -hmm. taste extremely bitter to you. Which I did not taste. And I did not taste very either. funny. Okay, so we were two of the nights just watching everybody freak out. And I'm like, it tastes like paper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're on. It's the chemical was embedded in these little slips of paper, and people would put it on their tongue, and you could yeah. tell if they really would taste. You could it tell immediately. Go, yeah. And their whole face would just sort of suck <laughs> in. That must have been fun to do for two days straight. It was a lot of fun, and eventually I got to a pretty good patter about what was going to happen, and what would also happen is mm. that people who had taken it and it had tasted really bitter. It was sort of the sour milk theory. Ooh, this tastes bad. Here, try it. They would go and get their friends and say, you have to try this. Put this <laughs> piece of paper on your tongue. Nice. Which is either genetic chemicals or LSD. It seems like that was a <laughs> potentially bad crossover. Oh, my God. Well, to raise money to get us there, we agreed that we would do uh, essentially scientific acts of whimsy, just yeah. random, potentially fun things that um, if you if we got donations up to certain levels, then that would unlock certain acts of whimsy. Right. Uh, I, I believe my uh, thesis abstract got turned into yes. a Mad Lib. Yes, there's one of our, our not safe for work <laughs> Mad Libs that are on my channel, so uh, yes. don't watch with the kids around. <laughs> yes, which was a lot of fun. Yes. And I was sort of brainstorming and sitting around trying to think of, of things that I could do. And I've been doing these video things with Dragon Con TV for a while now. And a lot of science people and a lot of just people who like good movies with um, coherent plots were kind of upset about Prometheus. So I heard. I've still never seen the movie, but now I don't need to. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I, it was one of those movies that I think... Um, really struck a chord with a lot of people that they were uh, 
it, it didn't deliver what they expected, so, yeah. and myself included, got really annoyed at some of the plot holes and the inconsistencies and the frankly terrible, not just terrible science, but scientists being really dumb in ways yeah. that I would hope scientists would not be. <laughs> so I thought, well, it would be funny to do something with that, but it would need to be something more entertaining than just me ranting at a camera for a while. Right. What if we did sock puppets? So I agreed to reenact parts of Prometheus with sock puppets and fix or at least comment on the scientific holes and the weird behavior of a lot of the characters and, and the fact that the minority characters have to all sacrifice themselves just because. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And we raised enough money, and then I realized, crap, you have to do now that. Now I have to do this. Yep. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I was not able to do it before the Geek Girl Con, but I, I swore I was going to do it, and so a couple of weeks later, uh, I managed to to do that, again, with help from my partner in crime, Renee, who made most of the sock puppets and painted the backdrops and, in general, pulled all of the physical stuff together. Nice, nice. Yeah, my favorite line is is when the medical machine says, I only answer to the patriarchy. <laughs> Which, uh, You've never so so the reason I got even though I've never seen the movie is I saw a panel with uh, Rebecca Watson and um, a couple of guys from MST3K. Oh, like Bill Corbett. And... But, yeah, Bill Corbett um, at another con <laughs> convergence, I think, and I saw a whole panel about the movie with them. Mm -hmm. and that basically explained everything I needed to know. So I was yeah. like, follow along with Saki. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I I don't know that it's coherent if you haven't seen right. or at least are familiar with the movie, uh, I decided rather than trying to reenact it all the way through, it was instead going to be vignettes commenting yes. on the various pieces that were the most sort of face palmy. I, I was impressed at the squid baby abortion. You guys did, the, did, really did justice to that Thank one. you. That was uh, was uh, a lot of fun. Oh, my God. <laughs> stapler, stapler. Anyway, stapler, stapler, so you stapler. guys, I'm rambling about this, but um, I put the link on the event page and on the YouTube, well, tried to put the link in the YouTube comments. But look, Google sock Metheus, it's really not hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> it is, in fact, I think the number one premier retelling of Prometheus with sock puppets. <laughs> sock Metheus. Sock Metheus. So um, we have a question from James Haney um, on the other tab that I'm not looking at. Okay, do you folks feel that one gender is more receptive to this kind of outreach at the convention environment than another? Have you seen any difference in how men or women react um, to science outreach at conventions? Huh. I... I used to joke around the time that Twilight came out, there was the whole uh, phenomenon of the Twi Moms, the, the women who were adult age and really into to that, and that was sort of the derisive term for them. For a while, especially because I was doing a lot of um, physics talks about things, I, for example, gave a talk about how there's no stealth in space. You can't make your spacecraft invisible, sorry, unless you invent new physics. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, of course, the kind Damn of thing you. that really brings out a lot of people who want to be hard science fiction writers. Yes. So I had, I sort of had sight ads for a while. Okay. Okay. Um, I can see that. But as I have talked across a bunch of different topics, I've not really seen a, a it's not been like, oh, I'm speaking to a room full of men, or, mm -hmm. well, this is only a topic that's interesting to women. Uh, it's been a, a pretty good gender balance in a lot of the, the, talks that I have been a part of and the panels that I've been a part of. So I don't know that it's as long as you're not signposting it with the right. kinds of cultural markers that will make people say, oh, well, this is guys only right. then I think there are a lot of women who are interested in science just like there are a lot of men who are interested in science. And right. so if you make a talk accessible and open then they will come. So no, I don't think I've really seen a, a big gender difference in the breakdown on how people have responded to outreach efforts. I think, I mean, even Geek Girl Conley commented on there were a lot of men and a lot of boys um, who were coming to the Science Zone and at the con in general. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to see much of the con in general outside. <laughs> so right. From our limited sample. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there was uh, a lot of a lot of men, a lot of fathers too, a lot of fathers with bringing the kids around and getting just as into the experiments as the yes. kids. Yes. Which is super exciting to see. Yay, I know. Outreach meant for kids that hits the parents, too. It's yep. just the greatest thing ever. Um, so, okay, so what, maybe what uh, other fandoms do you particularly like for um, doing science outreach with? Is there oh, any ones in particular? Gosh. Um, I got involved with the bronies. 
<laughs> Nicole has all the feels. This is how uh, we met. <laughs> this is, in fact, how we met. Yes. We bonding, bonding over, over the, the fact Twilight that Sparkle. Twilight Sparkle is the bestest pony. Obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was it. Was a case where I really liked the reboot of My Little Pony. I'd been watching it with my kids and and found it to just be fabulous. Both my son and my daughter really got into it. And I did a talk on finding exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. And I went through the various techniques that we, we use mm -hmm. to see if there are planets around another sun. Things like the Doppler shift as that planet drags the sun around, or looking for gravitational lensing, or things like that. And just sort of on a whim, I decided to have pedagogical ponies. I took each of the major ponies from My Little Pony and tied them to one of the different techniques of finding exoplanets. Oh my God. So it was there both so as sort of fun ha-ha ponies, but also I could use that visually to mark where I was and reinforce the different techniques and try to tie them into the various ponies' behaviors and personalities as much as I could. And there were a, a group of bronies who saw that and said, that was awesome! And so I started talking science to bronies. <laughs> I am so going to use pedagogical ponies. Uh, feel something. free. I have to. I will credit you, but I have to use that. Feel free to steal it. Do you guys see him also? I don't even have kids as an excuse, though. I, well, um... I, I'm pretty sure I would be watching it even without kids. I okay. have enjoyed it that much. And yeah. Again, that was one of those things I started out being ashamed of, and then I was like, you know what? No, I'm just I'm going to own that fact. I'm not even going to pretend. Own the brony hood. I like yes. it. Own the brony hood. I like it. I like it. Um... Trying to think what else. What other burning questions do people have, or do I have? <laughs> people, sorry, this is a comment by Joshua Warner. People like cool things. Do cool things and people like it. All people. I love that. I think that's an, an excellent summation, and that's yeah. I, sort of the mission statement for myself that I've evolved is I really like science, and mm -hmm. I like... I like having people understand science as a process and not an end product. I like people understanding yes. that science is something done by humans, not by these robots in white lab coats who right. warp, warp their way through science. And so one of the things that I really want to do is I want to personalize science. I tend to talk about the people who are involved in the science that I'm doing. You know, when I was talking about dark matter, I was tying dark matter and the Higgs boson together I guess that was last year, okay. uh, and talking about the astronomer Fritz Zwicky, who was brilliant and also just an amazingly mean-spirited curmudgeon at times. That's, that's being nice. <laughs> yeah, but I think it was important to say, here's this guy who uh, is, he has a personality, and this is kind of what he was like, but he was also doing really amazing science and could occasionally be really generous, see Science is people doing stuff. Yeah. So yeah. that's my... I, I try to, to communicate that excitement over science and science as a human endeavor um, in the outreach that I do. Cool. Well, he also added, especially using dry ice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, liquid nitrogen is even more fun if you yes. can get a hold of it and play with it. I, it is possible that in graduate school we had, I would say hot and cold, I guess, cold and cold running liquid nitrogen from the giant doer vat that sat outside the physics building in the back. So yep. we had it on tap, and it's possible that we had our systems administrator, uh, who I became really good friends with, and me and some of my friends might have poured some on his desk. Well, I have I never seen anybody couches. jump back so fast as it was just <laughs> boiling away at his desk. He, he was pretty sure we were trying to kill him. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. Oh my gosh. I like how these are things you may have possibly done. Well, they're, just, they're couched in so I, I don't know what the statute of limitations on those sorts of things are. <laughs> statute of limitations on, on <laughs> liquid nitrogen. Harassing, harassing the poor sysadmin. Yeah, no, that's like a person you don't want to piss off. <laughs> well, fortunately, he could harass us back, and we had a really good friend, friendship and working relationship. I just know that's not that's not the person you want to no. piss off, because they read all your stuff. Yes, he could have cut me off from all of my data. All of your data, all of your research. Yes. Um. So, ooh. I'm distracted by dry eyes now, <laughs> which I don't have on me at the moment. Um, brain. What am I? Oh, do you have any advice? Okay, so there are lots of big... So we talked about some of the big sci-fi. Dragon Con is one of the biggest science fiction conventions, and so there's lots of ways to get involved with science and space tracks there. Um, 
applying for guest status is not easy, but <laughs> no. sometimes they'll let you in as an attending professional, which which I've been able to do for the first time last year. Um, cool. But there are also a lot of, I know, I was very excited. Um, there are a lot of smaller local conventions, and so what if you have a local convention near you that mm -hmm. doesn't have any science programming? What would you suggest if someone's interested in, in doing that? Well, the, the thing that I've learned as I've started to get involved in more cons is that, especially for smaller cons, getting content and getting good content is an incredible struggle mm -hmm. because you're not drawing from as large of a pool of people you may have trouble finding. William Shatner is not coming to your Right, you're not con. going to be big media guests. Yeah. You may not be able to get big literary guests. Right. And so a lot of times you end up with panels that are that one guy who always rants about, take your pick, Larry Niven's ring world and has been for the last <laughs> 35 years, but we don't have anything else to put in that spot. Yeah. So what I advise, if this is something that you're interested in, is find a, a convention local to you, semi-local to you, a smaller convention to start with, and typically they'll have a website where they'll, they'll have links where you can email folks who are on the programming committee, the people who are putting the programming together. And you can contact them and say, hey, I do science. Um, here's what I can do for you. Because that's really mm -hmm. the key, especially any convention is barely held together by the volunteers. At any point, it's about to explode in 20 different directions. <laughs> so anything that makes the volunteers' lives harder is really unwelcome. Right. But things that make them easier make them very happy. So talking to them about the possibility, not necessarily of doing a lot of science programming, but even doing one or two panels on something that would be interesting to those attendees, um, a lot of people will, will jump at that chance. Now, it's important that you see what that convention is sort of focused on. Is right. it more sort of literary science fiction or hard science fiction? Is it an anime con? You know, are they talking about just TV and, and movies? And tying it to that, that topic, I think, is a good way to, to sort of start moving into there. And it's going to be more interesting for the attendees. You know, mm -hmm. I, I remember when Lawrence Krauss's book on the, the physics of Star Trek first came out. I was like, oh, this is the dumbest thing ever. And then it turned out to be really good. And I have read a whole lot of really good books and seen a whole lot of really good talks and presentations that tie science to something popular the mm -hmm. science of X, Y, or Z. And I realized I was sort of being a snob for no good reason. And in <laughs> fact, that's a really good way to engage people and bring people in, not that you're trying to fake them out. Uh, and it's important, I think, for example, if you have no interest in anime, don't go to an anime con. People can tell if you are being completely false about this kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, that's one of the things that I had to realize as I started to do more talks at science fiction conventions. I just had to be honest about the fact that I'm a, a big old science fiction nerd as well right. and not hide that because people can tell if you're being fake or if you're pretending to know, if you're like that, that high school counselor who just wants to rap with the kids. Oh, God. If you're that person in talking science at a at a science fiction convention, it will not go well. About either the science or the sci-fi, right? Yeah, right. You exactly. want to know what you're talking about on either end. Yes. Are you a fake geek girl, Stephen? I am. I have a shirt. <laughs> you have a shirt. <laughs> I, one of the things that um, a number of my friends, and uh, especially a lot of us on the, the Dragon Con staff, got really frustrated with was that whole fake geek girl thing mm -hmm. and had a lot of friends, including... Maybe friend you can Ali. explain a little bit of that for our audience. I, don't know I sure can. Is, 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 yeah. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of holdover from science fiction um, really being seen as sort of a masculine kind of thing and comic books being seen as sort of a masculine kind of thing that there is this sort of thing that got baked into the culture of, well, in a lot of cases, women who are coming in, they're faking it. Mm -hmm. And you can see that from, for example, people vetting when people cosplay, dress up as a character at a convention more often, women will get asked, well, do you really know about that character? Do you know Batgirl's history or whatever? Then men tend to get that. And it's something about having women move into what had previously been more male spaces mm -hmm. that there are some in the community who sort of appoint themselves as a, a guardian and a gatekeeper to say, well, let me, let me check your credentials. I need to see your papers and make sure right. you really are a geek and you're not just faking it for 
all of the... For whatever attention you're trying to get. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. So there is this idea of the fake geek girl. Right. The person who's not really a geek. She's just there for the attention. Mm-hmm. That's and you. <laughs> you're just there for the attention. In fact, a number of... Yes. And well, a, a number of my friends who are female had been getting this. And mm-hmm. in a lot of cases on subjects where I, I would be with them and I'm not getting vetted even though I knew far less about say, this area of comic books than she did, or this area of Doctor Who than I, than I. My friends, my female friends, would get vetted in ways that I never did. So I'm on the morning show at the, the Dragon Con convention, uh, which we call the late show because 9 a.m. at Dragon Con is really still late at You're night. You're still up. <laughs> so every morning we do a, a sort of 30-minute intro to the con, and here's what's going to be going on, and here's what's happening. And so we all agreed the my co-host Brian and Allie and I all wore our fake geek girl t-shirts because we think that stuff is crap. People should be able to come in and enjoy it. They should be able to enjoy fandom. They should be able to enjoy science fiction and fantasy, even if they're not super knowledgeable. Right, There's whatever more... level they're right. at, yeah. As a, as a recent comic book convert, I am <laughs> all about that. I'm still learning. Yeah, <laughs> and I think it is, for me, much more exciting to say, you don't know this? Cool. This is a cool thing. Let me. This is the issue yourself. you should read, and you should pick up this book first. But yeah, I love that. Right. Watch this rather, episode. <laughs> yes, I would rather people be enthusiastic for bringing them in and say, "Let's talk about it," rather than saying, "Oh, you don't know enough." Can't be here. Sorry. And even okay. things I'm I'm really super fandom about. I have a terrible memory, so it's just sure. And I get that. Uh, it's like I I don't have time for this. I'm moving on. So. Yeah. <laughs> But that is awesome. That is awesome that you're standing up for the fake geek girls. <laughs> for, for the real geek girls, <laughs> you get called the fake geek girls. Yes. Um, so what are you... Um, two things I was thinking of. Uh, one is, are there any other... So we've been talking mainly about sci-fi, fantasy, media conventions. Are there mm-hmm. any other um, places you do outreach, either traditional or, or non-traditional? I guess traditional would be in a school or something like right. that. Right, and I, I do go around to... To schools on occasion and, and talk or do hands-on science or things like that. Um, there is here in Huntsville a, um, a science museum called SciQuest and I've gotten involved with them. They do in-school outreach stuff and I said yes absolutely I will volunteer. <laughs> I, will, I will do that absolutely. Um, I have occasionally talked to Boy Scout, Girl Scout troops just sort of the ask a scientist kind yeah. of thing. I, I will happily go and be the scientist to be asked about things. That's actually a really popular panel with adults at sci-fi conventions as well, yeah. it seems. Um, on, on the, if you're on the Convergence planning, uh, that's apparently their most pop, one of their most popular panels every year is they throw a bunch of us on stage. <laughs> no planning, no prep. Well, and the, the, the thing that I realized is most people don't know a scientist right. in real life. It's not like they just have a scientist friend they can grab. I, I work in a high-tech industry covered over with scientists. Yeah. So... I'm used to the idea that, yeah, my next door neighbor up the street is a rocket scientist. He designs propulsion for NASA. That's that's just a thing. That's the way it works. But for most people, it doesn't work that way. Right. And there are, I, I also think that because culture has sort of inculcated this idea that the scientists are the white lab coats, remote beat board robots, that if you ask them a question, they will think you are the dumbest person ever. And to be fair, there are scientists who will do that. Yes. Uh, let's not pretend they're them. not out there. <laughs> but I like that there are a growing number of us who want to say, well, we're scientists and ask us anything. Yeah, it, it may be a question we've heard before. So you don't know the answer. You'd yeah. like to know it. Go ahead and ask it. And if I don't know, I will tell you. And, that's <laughs> and we'll the, look it up together. <laughs> yes, I've had to... <laughs> ask someone else. <laughs> I have had to be comfortable saying, yeah, that's a good question. This is kind of what I think, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Let's see where we can go and find out the real answer instead of me trying to, to yeah. fake it. I think that's what's really great about a panel is you have several people with different expertise. <clears throat> you can usually spread it out. Um, although we had like 10 people on that panel last year, and that was too much. Right. Like we were falling off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> great amount of expertise falling off the stage. Right. <laughs> so unfortunate. So are you working on any, um, do you have any new topics that have caught your eye that you're mm-hmm. thinking of working on? New topics. I've been thinking about that because now that I have several conventions scattered throughout the years, I sort of sort of have the rolling. What am I going to talk about next? Yeah. Um, I I really want to do one on just what's wrong with gravity. 
because <laughs> for everything we know about gravity, there's still a lot we don't know about gravity. Right. And it also gives me a chance to have the people who deny relativity come up and talk to me about it, which has happened. Oh. I've, I've got to oh. post that video, actually. Uh, when I did my Higgs boson and dark matter talk a while back, I had a guy stand up, and he went into this sort of minute and a half, two minute monologue that ended with, so when are scientists going to admit the lie of relativity? I was like, all right, we're off to the races. And, How did you handle that? <laughs> uh, well, I, I do need to get the video up because I, I think it went pretty well. I realized, number one, ridiculing him is not going to help. He's not heckling. He's just, this is something that he believes that he's really passionate about. Well, let me talk to him about that and take him seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was a serious question. He really wanted, he everything that he had researched and the decision he had come to is that relativity is a lie. And so I just sort of talked both to him and to the audience and say, well, here is, it's wrong to say I have a belief in relativity. I think it is right to say I have a lot of experimental evidence that says the tenets of relativity are correct. And we know that that's not all there is to understanding gravity because you take relativity and then you take quantum mechanics and you put them together and they don't, they don't work. It all yeah. breaks down. So we know that there's more that we need to know. But just as relativity didn't mean Newton was lying to you, uh, relativity covers all of the things that Newton's laws explain and more, we've got enough experimental evidence to say relativity explains a lot of this. If you want to replace relativity, you also have to explain all of this stuff that relativity explains. Otherwise, you're, you're not proving him wrong and, and displacing it. And he took that... He took that okay. Yeah, I mean, he didn't keep he, arguing because that's what I'm always afraid of is somebody who just keeps going. <laughs> we we went for probably about four or five minutes, and he was not mean about it. Oh, and that's I think, okay. That's good. Uh, yeah. Part of his frustration was that a lot of people, understandably, would get frustrated with him and just say mm -hmm. ah, ah and start yelling at him. Right. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. That's uncool. Yeah. And yeah. after a while, I said. This has been a good discussion. There are other people who need to ask questions. I'll talk to you some more afterwards. And I did. We had a, a polite and civil conversation afterwards. But I just had to sort of say, we've we've taken up a fair amount of time with this. I appreciate it. Let's move on. And to his credit, he, he took it really well. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm totally afraid that I'm going to get yelled at. <laughs> Yeah, and that happens. And but it, like you said, I mean, you approach happen. it with compassion, then you're, you're, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Well, it also, uh, I'll be honest. I, I have a deep voice. I am a, a white dude. I present as authoritative, yeah. and so people are less likely to yell at me as a default than they are someone who is younger or female or of color or things like that. Pink hair. <laughs> right. You're not serious. You can't be serious. I'm a fake. I'm a fake scientist, by the way. Right, fake scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Bring you that around. Uh, we have a comment from T.L. Sterling who says the vetting pisses me off. Uh, I've gotten that before. You're a girl, so what do you know about? Funny how some of the vetters don't seem to know that much about their own subject. I love throwing it back in their faces. It's right. very good, T.L. Um, unfortunately, I don't even have the, the, the I don't know patience to do that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, I can understand completely not engaging. I remember yeah. the, I guess it was about a year or so ago, there was that picture floating around the internet. It was um, of a woman who was cosplaying, and the guy had taken the picture and put a little caption by it that said, what was it? It was like, gender-swapped um, yeah. gender swapped steampunk joker. You're doing it, you're, you're trying too hard, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And, it wasn't that she was being the Joker gender swapped as sort of a steampunk dressed up thing. She was an actual character from the comics. Uh, Duella, what's her name? And so, hang on, I found it. I'm just guy was, share it. guy was calling her out for yeah. faking it up and doing all. There we go. This is the one. Yeah, because I saw this and I had no idea this was a character too. And I'm like, oh, that's a cool thing. I don't know why. Oh, that's actually the character. Right. Like, she looks like the character. <laughs> right. And so With saying, exquisite detail. I mean, yes. look at the, the lines on that thing. It's, yeah. So that guy um, got owned. Right. Instead of saying, huh, I wonder who she's dressed as, saying, well, I clearly know what you're trying and you're failing to do it, and then looking like a complete idiot because of it. Right. right. Yeah. So, so boo. Well, do all a dent. There we go. What is it? Yeah. So that, I can't believe I found that by Googling steampunk. 
what did I Google? <laughs> Cosplay steampunk Joker. That's what I Google. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Internet. <laughs> Thank you, Internet. You supply all awesomeness. <laughs> oh, man. So do you um have any other weird things that are like Sacmethius coming up, or do you think <laughs> that's uh, actually, it for you and bizarre things for a while? Uh, it is probably it for me and bizarre things for this year. Um, okay. I'm going to be meeting He says with... in no late November. Right, well, right. <laughs> uh, I still do a lot of videos that it's just going to ramp up next year. I'm going to be meeting with some of the local folks that I do stuff with, like Renee and her husband Alex, who's a videographer, like if you go and you watch our Hunger Games parody where we're trying to raise money for tributes, he did all of the cinematography on there and, and set that up and it's just beautiful because of that. So we're going to get together and sort of say, well, what do we want to do next year? What are the mm -hmm. things that we want to? And right now, it's just vague nebulous plans and nothing concrete. So I guess here at Thanksgiving, I can I can take off now. You can take off. Yeah, I you can, can take off the rest of the year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone will be busy with holiday stuff. We'll have con season coming up uh, around the bend really yes. soon. So. Yes, Balticon is going to be my first one. So if I'm going to talk gravity, I've got to start putting that together because it's been a decade since I looked at relativity with any seriousness. <laughs> Pull out my Miser, Thorn, and Wheeler. The only book, it's a book called Gravitation, and it is big enough to exhibit the property of gravitation. Wow. <laughs> it will deflect orbits as it, as it moves. It really will. It's a huge book. So Balticon is May. Balticon um, is May. So that's um, in Baltimore, obviously. Anyone who's in that area should check that one out. I still have not been to Balticon. <laughs> Even it's a lot of fun. It's, yeah. it's a, an older, more traditional scientific <coughs> convention that has sort of morphed to include more media stuff and a lot of younger yeah. attendees. You know, a lot of the traditional cons are populated by people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and are sort of unwelcoming to people who are younger and into different fandoms and are not necessarily reading all of the classics from the 70s and 80s. And Balticon has avoided that, and they have a really kick-ass science contingent. I mean, I've gotten to interview uh, Nobel Prize winner Bill Phillips, which was awesome, and also uh, Dr. Gates was last year to talk about string theory. Very so cool. they, they bring in good science. Very cool. There's that one. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of all the locations. Um, Convergence is in Minneapolis in July. Right. Anyone up in that area, that is a really fun con, and they feed you the whole time. There's oh, actually nice. free food and free coffee at this con. Excellent. Yeah, it's amazing. I approve. Um, yes, and so we're we're both on the back channel that's planning a lot of the science and skeptical content for that con convention. Mm -hmm. um, and what else is there? So Dragon Con is Atlanta. Dragon Con in Atlanta at the end of August. The end of August. Um, then, Geek Girl know, Con. I was going to say we probably will get back to Geek yeah. Girl Con. I hope so. That that's was, Seattle. Was so we're we're fun. hitting various places around the U.S. You guys can come. Touring scientists. Yes, yes, the Torrent Scientists. These are the cons that we know have science. Um, our cons is, is a really small con. Not really small. It's a St. Louis uh, con, which I went to for the first time this year, and there are a couple of science people that do things. Um, John Voisey uh, talks about, actually, uh, physics in anime. Bad physics in anime. He has a really fun talk on that. Oh, wow. Of course, I don't get the anime... Re I don't get most of the anime references, and the audience does, but I get the physics references. <laughs> <laughs> like, a split second before the audience does, and he's like, do it. <laughs> yeah, that's a really fun... He, he, he up and he updates it every year with new, new material. Same topic, new material every year. Wow. Um, so, so, They've not yeah. stopped making anime, so no. I can... I can completely believe that. He has not run out of bad physics in anime. That's <laughs> impossible to do, it seems. Right. Um, and so I'm going to hopefully maybe get involved with that one since it's it's literally a 20-minute drive from my house. Cool. Um, any well, other I'm... good cons you want to promote? I don't know. I occasionally hit smaller local conventions. Mm -hmm. I've done Geek Media Expo up in Nashville a couple of times. I keep meaning to get down to some of the Birmingham conventions. Um, but... I'm not at the point where people will pay me to go and do this, so yeah. it's yeah. on my own time and my own dime, so I'm limited. I... On Sockmethius dimes. <laughs> on on Sockmethius dimes, yes. <laughs> hey, listen, that was the finest that $50 worth of socks and yarn and helmets <laughs> and paints and backdrops could buy. And a tiny little squid baby. <laughs> and a tiny little squid baby and a little cricket machine to be the med pod. Oh, yeah. my God. We, we don't that what that, well, what was that? What was that, actually? Uh, it's the... called a cricket. Uh, okay. C R I C U T, and it does different cutting things for. Oh, okay. For 
hand, you know, crafting kind of stuff. Making stuff, okay. Yes, we needed one, and we looked around, and Renee's like, here! And I said, yes, that's perfect. <laughs> that was pretty much perfect, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I think I'm going to uh, ask you guys again if you uh, want to leave us a comment or a question. You can do so on the YouTube page. Um, Joshua Warner has p posted a link to a video about screaming quarters using dry ice, which I think you, we should all go watch at the end of this Excellent. broadcast. Um, so apparently YouTube comments are now taking links, so yay. Um, and, and, and when we're done with this broadcast, you absolutely have to go see Sokmetheus. Even if you haven't seen the movie, if you've just heard of it and, and how silly it was. It, it, it's a lot of um, good sci-fi tropes that come up in other films anyway, so I think you'll get it for that. Yes. <laughs> so, do check out those videos before you go wander off to do something important. Um, <laughs> um, I think I'm going to... if you. I'm going to wrap it up with a few announcements, and then I will leave it to Stephen to give us a last word on how awesome outreach is okay. <laughs> in, in weird stuff. Um, so today is Wednesday, which means that our next Hangout will be the weekly Space Hangout on Friday at noon Pacific. Uh, we uh, Fraser Kane gets a bunch of us together to talk about the space and astronomy news in the last week. Uh, so uh, you should join that. It's always a good time. Uh, the week, the virtual star party is on Sunday night, and that has been pulled back to, I think, 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, so it's now nice and early for everyone in the Central and Eastern time zones, and I've actually been able to make one of them recently. Um, so check that out on Sunday night's virtual star party. Monday, I'm pretty sure Pamela will be back from Indonesia, so there'll be an astronomy cast recording with uh, Pamela Gay and Fraser Kane. Uh, before I abscond with Pamela to go see Doctor Who in the movie theater. <laughs> yes, I'm so excited. Um, and next Wednesday, uh, there'll be a learning space, although it's really hard to find a guest who was willing to do Thanksgiving Eve, so I will come up with something fun and silly uh, to do for you guys, since I'm not going anywhere for Thanksgiving, so I'll... Oh. Oh, I know that. No, I'm going to Pamela's house. <laughs> I can't afford to fly to New York, so I'm going to Pamela's house. It's fine. Uh, so, yeah, that is our upcoming schedule. Um, while Pamela is in Indonesia, she has been broadcasting sessions from the South Southeast Asian Young Astronomers Conference. Uh, so you can check out those hangouts on the um, plus.google.com slash plus CosmoQuest, our CosmoQuest page. They're all archived there, and I don't know if they have any more coming up. If they do, I'm sure she's going to try and broadcast them. So if you're up late at night, U.S. time, or... Uh, actually at a decent time zone to, to watch the Indonesian broadcast. You should check that out. Uh, so that, I think, is all of our upcoming stuff. Um, Stephen, maybe you can give us some last words um, encouraging people, not just scientists, but anyone interested in science, to, to do this kind of outreach. Sure. Well, I, like I said, I, I have, I'm fairly passionate about these kinds of things. And in some ways, doing these talks at science fiction conventions is going for the low-hanging fruit. If someone is willing to come and listen to someone talk about science when you're at a science fiction convention where there are all these other things going on, they're already interested. That first hump of getting yeah. people interested, I'm past that. So then if I can just keep their attention and, and get some learning on, that's great. Um, I, for those of you who are interested in science, I, I love having people do more outreach. I love people just talking about science and, and what science is like and the discoveries that have happened and, and sharing that kind of enthusiasm. And in general, I like enthusiastic people talking about neat things. Um, there's so much of science that everybody go talk all the things and also spare a thought for the people who are teaching because mm. having used to taught and then now doing this, I have a much easier time with the let me come in and talk for an hour and be really enthusiastic and give you a handful of things that you may or may not remember versus I need to help you learn something over the course of a semester or a year. That's a much harder job. Yeah. Congratulations, teachers. And, and remember those teachers. Remember them and, and, and give them content, because they love new content. Yes. <laughs> I think that helps. <laughs> um, oh, speaking of which, I should, I should also um, <clears throat> remind everyone that, um, speaking of teachers and content, <laughs> we are finishing up our uh, asteroid unit called Investigate. And oh, I used to have it written down somewhere. But because we're silly like that, 
It's um, connected to the uh, Citizen Science Project where you're mapping the asteroid Vesta, and so we called it Investigate. Nice. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't claim. I can't claim. That was one of my coworkers. But um, we are making that available in draft form. We need teachers to beta test some of the activities. Uh, if you want to look it over and just give us a perspective from the write-up what it, how it looks, or um, try a few of the new activities, uh, please let us know. You can email us at educate at cosmoquest.org. Uh, we are looking for beta testers to play with it. And I'm going to probably try and beta test some of these activities, see if there's a, a, a Girl Scout troop willing to be subjected to new asteroid activity. Excellent. <laughs> Yay! So thank you. If you can do that, please email us. Let us know um, because we like to give you content, but we want it to be vetted first. So awesome! All right, I think that wraps it up for this week's episode of Learning Space. Thank you so much, Stephen, for joining me. No, thanks for having me. I will see you on the Convergence back channel. Yes. <laughs> thanks, everybody. See you next week.